everybody would join me in your Bibles in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15. Excuse me, we'll start reading actually at verse 12 if you would stand in honor of God's Word. The Apostle Paul writes, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all else, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony and lets the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Lord, I pray today that we would learn how to live our lives with grateful hearts, that we would be a thankful people, and we'd realize how critical that is to Christian maturity, living with thankfulness and gratitude in our hearts and showing that to others and honoring you with the way that we live our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Many years ago, we uh, in our nation had the first Thanksgiving, and um, of course our land was filled with Native Americans for many years who uh, understood well how to uh, fish and hunt, and they harvested for many generations. Um, there we are. Okay, so many years ago, uh, we had many Native Americans in this land, and they knew well how to fish and hunt and take care of themselves in our, uh, on our land. And um, the people who compromised Plymouth College who left uh, the Church of England because, in part, they wanted religious freedom and religious liberty, something we heard about last Sunday night. But, of course, they were not familiar with our land. They needed help, and, and uh, a man by the name of Squanto, uh, as we know of him, and some others came and met with them, uh, met with the early settlers, and, of course, taught them how to uh, harvest, how to hunt, how to fish, and how to uh, do many of the things needed to sustain life on our land. And if you're familiar with the story, um, after a hard winter, uh, they gathered together for that first Thanksgiving meal and gave thanks to God and ate together and celebrated God's provision for them. As we gather for Thanksgiving, we are in some ways hearkening back to, of course, that first Thanksgiving, and we are reenacting that as we offer thanks to God and we praise him for all of his provisions that he has provided for us. And that's in part what holidays are for. Holidays are uh, teaching opportunities. They were in the early days of Scripture in the Old Testament, and even until today, even though some of that has lost its meaning and we don't think about holidays as an educational uh, way of learning about uh, our past and uh, remembering our story and our identity, who we are and where we came from. And today we're going to talk about how we can live our lives with grateful hearts how all believers can live their lives with grateful hearts. And I want to say we can do that today by celebrating three glorious truths. And number one is peace. Peace. Look at verse 15, if you would. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Peace is something that Uh, should define the Christian life. We live in a world where there are storms, there's brokenness, there's heartache, there's pain, 
And yet, even in the midst of that, we can live with thankfulness. We can live with peace in our hearts because of what Christ did so many years ago. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It's a decision that we make each and every day to allow the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts. And of course, we know the story of Jesus when he was on that boat and it was stormy and and all the disciples were fretting. Yet even in the midst of the storm, we see this picture of our Savior sleeping. He was at total peace, and then he rose, and he spoke to the storm, and he said, Peace, be still. And so the disciples, precisely because they were with Jesus, could have allowed that peace to rule their hearts. And you may be going through storms in your own life, and what Scripture is telling us is even in the midst of those storms, realize who you're with. Who is with you? The Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what he accomplished for you so many years years ago. I want to invite you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. Here in just a few weeks, we're actually going to preach through uh, this chapter, but I just want to draw out one claim in particular in Isaiah chapter 11, a beautiful picture of the peace, the shalom that we await as a consequence of the coming Messiah. It says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain." This is an Old Testament picture of the coming of the Messiah. And with the coming of the Messiah would be peace on earth. There would be this shalom-type atmosphere. My favorite painting, if we could get that up on the screen, one of my favorite paintings is this painting called The Peaceable Kingdom. And you see here, in some ways, it is a reproduction, a picture of what we find in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, where all of these animals, which you would never see together in the animal kingdom, just hanging out together, are seen, pictured here uh, together. Why? Because it's a reminder of the peace that will accompany God's kingdom. But what I like about this picture, if you look in the background, you see some of our early pioneers and pilgrims sitting down, or at least together with, uh, the Native Americans who uh, were uh, on this land when we arrived. It's a picture of peace again. And so every time we sit down and enjoy that Thanksgiving meal, we should be reminded not only of the peace that we've enjoyed at certain points in our own nation, but more ultimately, the peace that we find in Jesus Christ as a consequence of what he accomplished on the cross. I'm a believer in what they call the already not yet of Scripture. In other words, that Christ has launched some things. He's inaugurated some things. When he came on earth, he put some things in place and started some things that we enjoy to some degree now, and yet one day we will enjoy it more fully in the new heavens and the new earth. And one of those things is peace. Of course, as we look around the world, we know that there's not right now peace on earth in the way that we would understand it in its fullest sense. There's violence, there's racism, there's hatred, uh, there's many vile and terrible things that are happening in our world today. And yet even in the midst of that storm, it's precisely because of Christ that we can live in peace. Notice again what he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So often we allow ourselves to be ruled by other things, don't we? And particularly, if you watch the news, if you read the newspapers, if you see some of the many things going on in the world today, it's real easy to allow those narratives, those things to begin to rule in our hearts and weigh in on our thinking and our mindsets where we wake up and we go through the day, and it's hard to be thankful, it's hard to be grateful. How could we be thankful? How could we be grateful with all the things going on in the world? And certainly there's a sense in which we do grieve with those who are grieving and we have compassion for the poor and so forth. And and we should have a disgust uh, at the certain elements that we find in our world today. That's why it's totally okay for us to sing that Johnny Cash song, I'm the man in black. Okay? There's a sense in which we should suffer with those who suffer. We should 
pray for those who are persecuted. We should be grieved over those things, and there's a time to wear black, to be that man in black. But the reality is, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and the consequence of that is that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And it is a picture of what awaits us in the new heavens and the new earth. The second reason that we can live with grateful hearts is because of God's presence. Presence. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Why can we live with thankfulness in our hearts to God? Why do we sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs? Why do we do all of these things? It's because the word of Christ dwells within us. It's because of his presence. Some of my favorite uh, videos to watch are some of our military coming home for either Thanksgiving or for a holiday and simply uh, noticing their presence as the kids see them for the first time in a while, the, uh, the spouse sees them for the first time in a while, there is celebration. All of the things that might weigh down on your spirit in the world, for a moment those things are marginalized and there's just celebration. It is a moving picture to see that. For me, I... Uh, remember as I went for just a couple of weeks to uh, a mission trip and I was away from my family, that reunion, that reuniting uh, was something that I looked forward to. I looked forward to it. And when that moment finally came, I was overwhelmed simply being in the presence of my family. And I gave thanks. We give thanks ultimately because Christ came to us. The Bible says that he literally pitched his tent in our midst. That's the greatest homecoming of them all. And yet we look forward to another one. And just like in that moment where we see the reunion between a, 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 in a military family where, some, where the husband or the wife comes home after spending months and months and months away and all of the terrible things in the world are marginalized in that moment, there ought to be a place and a time where as we walk through those doors, as we sing some of the songs and the hymns that we sing together, that for a moment, those things that might overwhelm our minds and at times might fight to rule our hearts instead of peace, they're marginalized, and we find ourselves basking in the grace and the glory of Jesus, who he is, and what he did on our behalf. Because just as Jesus walked with his disciples, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit is with us now. And that ought to move us to sing, as it says here, notice again, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. This is a choice that we must make. Just as we must choose to allow peace to rule in our hearts rather than the chaos that we find out in the world, in the same way, we must let the word of Christ dwell in our hearts richly. Notice again, let the word. It's a conditional kind of statement. It is a command for us. It's not just something that happens naturally. We allow a lot of other things to dwell in us and take up residence within our hearts. It might be bitterness. It might be unforgiveness. It might be hate. It might be disgust at some of the things we see going on in the world. And yet, how can we live with grateful hearts? By remembering the presence of Christ, by letting the word of Christ dwell in our hearts richly. You can't do that unless you read it. Reading this book is what pulls you up above all of the uh, chaos that we see in the world and allows you to see the picture fully and give praise to God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's not reading a scripture as you rush out the door in the morning. That's dwelling in it. That's just taking up, allowing the word just to take up residence in you. The presence of God. And finally, number three, provision. 
provision. It says in verse 17, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I want to skip back up to where we started at verse 12. This entire section is talking about putting on the new self. You say, okay, well, you know what? I accepted Christ. The Holy Spirit lives within me. I'm regenerate. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Indeed you are. And yet, even at the same time, Paul is telling this church to put on the new self. He's saying, then live that way. Since that's the reality in your heart, live that way. The first reality that ought to lead us to have grateful hearts peace, the second one, God's presence with us. But the third one is his provision for us. He says in verse 12, Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Why do we forgive? God forgave us. Living in that reality of being forgiven ought to rule out the bitterness that sometimes can take root in our hearts. How can you be grateful and thankful and at the same time be bitter? They don't go together. They don't live together, bitterness and thankfulness. The love of Christ. The love of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, I love that hymn, The Things of This World grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. What God has provided for us is forgiveness, grace, and mercy. And the things of this world grow strangely dim as we recognize these realities. So many times we, we might sit down at the table and we've got food on the table, but kind of like Israel, you remember Israel? They've got food basically falling from the sky, and they, well, you know, I like my meat a little redder than that. I don't appreciate that. I, I'd like to eat something else. God has provided for us, and yet we have a choice as to whether or not to be mature enough to recognize his provision in our lives. One of the things that we do is share a meal together, particularly what is called communion, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. Why do we do this? Well, let's think about a couple of things as we wrap up the sermon and move into the Lord's Supper. Why do we share meals together? Well, we share Thanksgiving because we want to remember our national heritage. How does that relate to Scripture? In the Old Testament, Israel was in bondage. Just as these uh, pilgrims fled from England to enjoy religious liberty, so our spiritual ancestors were in a place where they were in bondage. They were not allowed to live in freedom. And God sent his servant Moses in to let them out, to set his people free. And of course, the last plague is what is called the Passover. They put the blood of the lamb on the doors of their house and consequently they were passed over in judgment. And what did God tell them to do thereafter? After they got out, they were supposed to reenact that event time after time after time again. Why? To teach to the younger generations what God has done. I think there's an epidemic today of forgetting how we got to where we are as a nation and as a spiritual people called the church. There's an epidemic of forgetting, of not remembering. Holidays are one of those things set in place to help us remember, to guard against forgetting. It's true for Thanksgiving, but in a much more biblical sense, it was true of Passover. God is saying, no, remember 
who you are and where you came from. You would not be where you are. You would not be who you are had I not shown my grace and mercy to you and offered my forgiveness to you. And so they celebrated Passover. And there was one time that Jesus celebrated, he celebrated many times, but one time in particular he celebrated with his disciples. And we're going to read the passage a little bit later, but I want to go ahead and read it for you today. In 1 Corinthians, I want to read it to you right now. Folks, I'm drugged up this morning, if you can't tell. If I get out of here without preaching heresy, we should all give thanks. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says, I receive from the Lord, that word receive, it's the same kind of word to mean he received a tradition. Do any of your families have traditions around Thanksgiving? I remember when Sarah's grandmother was alive, we'd go to Louisiana, Transylvania, Louisiana, one of the many traditions, writing down on a card what we're thankful for. And Paul, her grandfather, would read that for the family, and we would all... Uh, Think about what we're thankful for. It's a tradition. Traditions are passed down from one generation to the next generation. And this is a tradition that was passed down to Paul. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, I'll stop right there for just a moment, given thanks. Other uh, sometimes you, you might hear of the Lord's Supper. It's not as common in Protestant circles. Uh, but sometimes you might hear it referred to as the Eucharist. That is a word literally meaning thanksgiving. Given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. And what does he say? Do this in remembrance of me. Communion is an ordinance of the church. It's unlike baptism, which is an ordinance we do one time, and that's good. But no, this is a perpetual ordinance that we continue to carry out month after month, year after year. Why? So that we remember who we are and where we came from. It's educational. It's edifying for us. Why did God put the Passover into effect so that Israel would be stronger as they realized who they were? Why do we have the Lord's Supper? To remember Jesus, to reflect on him with meditation, who he is and what he accomplished for us so many years ago, that he died on the cross for our sins and God raised him from the dead. In just a moment, uh, we're going to observe communion as a church family. But first, it's important that we spend time examining our hearts seeing if there's any unconfessed sin in our lives, seeing if perhaps we've harbored bitterness before we come to the Lord's table and we say, thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Have you forgiven others just as he forgave you? Have you let the peace of Christ rule your heart or are you allowing the muck and the mire of this world to rule your heart, the brokenness out there? Are you allowing that to marginalize the peace of God in your heart. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Reflect on his presence. Reflect on his provision. All of these realities ought to well up within us and bring us to a place where we celebrate, we live lives of thankfulness. Gracious Father, as we come to this time of response, I pray if anyone is here today, who has not received the grace that passes all measure, have not trusted in Jesus for salvation, I pray, Lord, that today they would make that right. I pray that we would reflect on these realities today. And as we go into this week, allow these realities of your peace, your presence, and your provision to drown out those competing voices from the world. In the midst of the storm, I pray we can follow the example of Jesus and just be at rest 
to take him up on his promise to come, ye who are weary and heavy laden, and find rest for your souls. Lord, help us to meditate on these realities. Your peace, your presence, your provision. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The altar is open if God would lead you this morning to come and respond. I pray that you'll do so. If this morning you just need to come kneel down and say, God, I don't want to take this communion without having a grateful heart, without thankfulness in my heart. So, Lord, please create in me a clean heart. Give me clean hands and a pure heart. Remove any bitterness, anything I'm withholding from someone else. Lord, I ask your forgiveness. I confess my sin. Make my heart right before you. Let's stand and the altar's open as the Lord leads. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord For all you've given to me For all the blessings that I can't see Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord, with a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name. Thank you, Lord, I just want to thank. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For all you've done in my life, you took my darkness and gave me your light. Thank you. took my sin and my shame. You took my sickness and healed all my pain. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank seated. All right, this time we're going to observe uh, communion. I'm going to ask the deacons, if they would, to come and, and uh, take their places. As they come down, I want to go ahead and just introduce to you my brother Alex. Alex, if you would, come on up here and stand with me. This is Alex, and uh, this morning he came down, and he said, I want to trust in Jesus. And so we went through the uh, the sinner's prayer together, and he has placed his faith in Jesus Christ as Lord of his life. If you rejoice, say amen. So I'm going to ask him if he would just to be seated right here at the end of the service. We'll uh, have opportunity to go by and shake his hands and encourage him in the Lord. As we prepare for um, the Lord's Supper, I want to read a hymn. I just want you to... Uh, Bow your heads and close your eyes as I read this hymn. O sacred head now wounded, with grief and shame weighed down, now scorf scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown. How pale thou art with anguish, with sore abuse and scorn. How does that visage languish, which once was bright as morn? What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Lo, here I fall, my Savior, tis I deserve thy place. Look on me with thy favor, vouchsafe to me thy grace. 
What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end? Oh, make me thine forever, and should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love to thee. Gracious Father, as we come to this time of communion, we give thanks to you for salvation, and we dedicate this Lord's Supper to you and to your glory. We pray your blessing to be upon it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time I'm going to ask the deacons if they would to pass out the bread, which is symbolic of the body of Jesus Christ broken for us. flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe There's a place where sin and shame are powerless, and there my heart has peace with God and forgiveness, where all surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. When your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. Here my hope is found. Here on holy ground. Here I I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you, when your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, I owe all to you.
Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Corinthians 10, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a communion in the body of Christ? At this time, we take the cup, which is symbolic of Jesus' blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins to purify us and make us whole as the deacons pass out the cup.
Jesus at the cross. So we share in this bread of life, and we drink of this sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table. Likewise, after the supper, Jesus said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Today, I hope you've been blessed, and I know, know this church has been edified by spending time reflecting on the broken body of Jesus, his blood being spilt for us. And I pray that as we go through this week of Thanksgiving, that that would be the foundation of everything else that you're thankful for, that everything that you do, that you do it in the name of Jesus, with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. Let's pray, and then we'll be closed this morning, or we'll sing a final song. Brother Darrell, could we end today by singing Amazing Grace? Could I pull an audible? And let's sing Amazing Grace. And I think that would be appropriate. Um, gracious Father, Lord, I pray today that as we conclude this service, that we would be thankful for your amazing grace that passes all understanding and all knowledge. I pray, Father, that you would bless this congregation today. And, Lord, that we would reflect on your goodness throughout this week. That as we've eaten this bread and drank this cup, that we would taste and see the Lord is good. That we would know this is a taste of forgiveness, of grace. And let those things take root in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet. That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I am found Was blind But now I see When we bend bent Bless you.